Um, we have, as requested, we've all gone through at least chapter three in the book. So we all have at least some clue as to what we're going to be talking about tonight. I, I think I told you before, we did decide to go with, with the codes that you and Joe put in the book. Okay. So to make it easy. Um, anything else in terms of setup that we... I don't know. I mean, Lang, it was up to you what you want to do with the keyboard codes. So that was your choice. Um, the rest of this yeah. up from chapter two, did you follow that? Yeah. Okay. Cool. And again, as you go through it on your own and you start coding more frequently, you'll you'll find that maybe something is a little bit more natural for you than maybe what we have in there. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just a jumping off point. Um, the codes and the kind of keyboard configurations and the attack combinations and stuff. Um, I'm really comfortable with those because that's just the way that Joe taught me when I first showed up in Anaheim to volunteer with him. Um, mm -hmm. And I just have been coding um, like that ever since. I'd say I'm probably still kind of 90% what Joe um, Joe did in his time with the national team in the 16 quad, which is essentially what is in the book. Um, mm -hmm. right. Everybody, again, kind of evolves from there. Um, so don't feel like you have to just like put this in concrete for it by any right. Mm. Right? yeah um, the original and the, and the default codes in data volume are basically the ones they use overseas aren't they it yeah seems like. yeah yeah, yeah <laughs> for the most part um <laughs> yeah I I mean, again, data volley it, it is an italian program right mm -hmm. so um it's not surprising that most people especially in europe um use those same attack combinations um, I just have, have had a hard time putting my brain around the logic as to why certain things are the way they are in those attack combinations. So the way Joe explained it and built his made a lot of sense to me, which to be perfectly honest, I wrote this book in the summer of 16, I want to say, so I don't remember it verbatim right now, but <laughs> I, I don't remember if I put the logic behind the attack combinations in there. Um, I want to say there's at least a little bit of that, I feel like. Yeah, I mean, we yeah. can talk about it real quickly. And again, you can see the reasons why we put it the way we did. Um, step number one is always we want to eliminate the distance your fingers have to travel. Um, just, you know, I, I, if you have to go really far, it just slows you down um, mm -hmm. in the long run. Um, two is there's just some logic to it. So instead of I've seen some schools use like X and then numbers all the way across for, or like P and then numbers all the way across for all their attack combinations. Um, for me, it's like easier to differentiate stuff quickly, um, whether it's I'm trying to filter things down in the video or create worksheets and do analysis. Um, if the first letter of the attack combination is, is unique to other types that are like attacks. So for instance, in system attacks, um, that are on the pins, start with a P. Kind of makes sense, right? So a PG would be a go, PR would be a red for us. I don't, I don't know what your, your set calls are at Medai, but um, that's our in-system set to our opposite. Um, and then like P4 and P2 would be those inside sets in system, in zone two or in zone four that are, you know, further inside. Um, so that kind of made sense to me, right? It, it just made things easier for me to more quickly associate what we were trying to do or what a team was trying to do in that situation without having to go and translate what an X4 is or what a, you know, a P7 is or what, what have you. So like middle attacks, for instance, off of two feet starts with a G. Um, so if it's two footed in the gap space, so like a three or 31 or a gap, it's a GG. If it's like a tight quick or a one, it's GT, so off two feet, tight to the center is, you know, GT. Um, an A or a quick behind, that A quick behind is a GA. And then off of one foot for a middle, we do with, with a C, right? So everything that you're hitting off of one foot is a C. So a slide to the pin is CS. Um, an A or a, a quick tight behind off of one foot is a CA. Um, so it just, again, it made a lot of sense to me to differentiate those different attacks so you can more quickly group things together. Um, back row attacks in system all start with an I. Everything on a system starts with a V, um, which I think is actually the same in volumetrics. Um, but we, or Joe, tried to put it together so there was some groupings there aside from just a number association. Right. Yeah, it's pretty obvious when you go through the book 
how the bunches are done. Because and it and it's interesting when you first see the the, the attack combinations there in default because some of them are, are clearly some sort of Italian phraseology. Like <laughs> I don't know what that is. I mean, just yeah. not by the name of it. Obviously, if you go in and you see where it is, but the arrows, you might be able to figure out. Okay, they're talking about this. Um, and we, Lang and I, were discussing what's the best way to just put the codes in. And from my experience, I ended up doing it two different ways. First, trying to overwrite the existing ones where I saw a match, because uh, I put it in on my personal laptop. And then when I was putting it on a school laptop, I was like, no, you know, what? I'm just going to delete all these out. And I'm just going to put the new ones in. Because it was, it, and it was so much faster that way. Yeah. Um, what'd, you, what'd you end up doing, Lang? I ended up just deleting everything and starting over. Because yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's so quick to put them in. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's not super complicated. The one thing that, like, for an individual staff, I, I would recommend, and, and I can walk you guys through how to do this. Um, this is not in the book, but what happens sometimes is if, if, so, John, you put in the attack combinations manually on your laptop. Ryan, you put it in manually on your laptop. Mm -hmm. But they may not match if you're trying to share a scout file across, and it might ask you to do some sort of uh, attack combination conversion process because they're not exactly the same. So, for instance, the coordinate at which you clicked where your go set is at is slightly off, right? And then all of a sudden, data volume is like, these are two different attacks. What do you want to do with them, right? So um, what I did when I came here to Grand Canyon was I had the attack combinations obviously already on my laptop. Um, and I was able to basically just click and drag the actual file on the back ends in the installation folder for data volley um, to um, our other staff members' laptops just so they wouldn't have to hit those errors and that kind of stuff. And it's just a, a little bit more, it's a little cleaner, a little more seamless. Right. Yeah, that was that was a question I had when I was looking at it. It was just like, because you can you can do all the rosters, you can share rosters and, mm -hmm. and, and all that stuff. But I was like, can't you share these files like easily? I mean, obviously. Uh, now, easily drag and drop a file from a folder is not that big a deal if you know that it exists in a, in a way that you can do it. But now that you've said yeah. that, it's like, all right, yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense. To be perfectly honest, there might be a tool in Data Volley that allows you to just export everything, but I didn't learn it that way. So <laughs> I didn't do it. Uh, I'm a little. Uh, uh, my nerdiness level goes a little bit beyond trying to make things easy. I try to make things a little bit too complicated for myself sometimes. Um, oh, Lang, that sounds exactly like you. Yeah, yeah. in the right place. I love, I love really complicated directory structures, and you know, it's just that's just how oh, I'm kind of wired. So, it's unfortunate for others, but it, it again, if it logically makes sense to me, then then that's I, that's what matters. Yeah. Um, All right. So, so how, how do you how do you guys wanna wanna start this? Um, okay. I mean, I mean, Lang, you've got you've got the key. You've got everything there. So, you've got a match queued up. You got the the Baron match queued up. Yeah, I have the Baron match already. I just had to put. I didn't put the lineup in. That's the only thing I didn't do. So why don't we do this right now? So have you? Um, and this is for. Uh, I'm assuming Ryan's going to be doing the bulk of the actual coding work for you guys, yeah. but. Um, well, have for this Ryan example, yes. Specifically, <laughs> and then either the two of you, um, John or Simone, actually tried coding yet at all, or have you just kind of gone through the setup process? Uh, I've gone through the setup process. Well, yes, yeah, Simone had a little bit of a problem. <laughs> yeah, um, my <laughs> Windows 10 expired just as I was like getting right into it. So. <laughs> it's set to so. Yeah, so I'm, I'm okay. set up, and I've I, I haven't gotten a chance to play around with the coding yet. Um, but it is something I want to do now that semester's running out, and we've got a break. I mean, up. to be perfectly fair, John, as the head coach, you probably shouldn't have to do any a lot of manual coding. <laughs> so. the, the, well, the issue is I'm the only full timer on the staff. Uh, here. Okay, yeah. The other two have jobs, so inevitably there's going to be times. Well, I mean, side note, if you want to talk about, say, Division One Power 5, usually those staffs have somebody there to do the coding. Mm -hmm. Then you talk to Jason Kennedy, who's the head coach at Boston College, and he's coding everything for themselves at, <laughs> at BC. You know, you just, they don't have somebody there who can do it. So right. um, he's, he's well, doing stuff on his own. Or he's so, just a glutton. Yeah, he's a glutton for fun. <laughs> That's why he's got a roster of, like, 48 right now. Oh, jeez. He's got a D3 roster size. <laughs> Well, I wish we had a D3 roster size like that. 
We've, we've got eight. <laughs> yeah, you're on the other end of the spectrum there. <laughs> yeah. So, all right. So, um, so Ryan, then, um, ha have you tried coding yet? I tried as a test format, and I, I was like, nope. I can't do this. <laughs> okay. So, so we can, um, what we'll do then is, um, John, I, I don't know if I have access to share screen. I'll try and do that. Yeah, I can, um, uh, I can and do those. So Ryan, after you put your lineups in, just for that first set, mm -hmm. wherever you are in the match, um, you can just ignore your data volley for now and maybe just take some notes okay. as we go through. And then I'll talk through some of the logic of the codes and how you code and why. Okay. Um, and then you can kind of watch the process um, as we go through. Um, right. Full disclosure, I have not coded live since October of 2019, Norseka Continental Championships. So well, here, and I here my, I was gonna ask you if, you if you've been coding during practices to this fall and we're no, kind of jonesing um, for actual live matches to work with. Yeah, we've we've had maybe nine days of six on six that we got to do this this semester just because of, you know, having to ramp things up slowly mm -hmm. just to make sure we don't break kids. Um, and then just between various, you know, campus COVID shutdowns and quarantines and right. um, it just it, there hasn't been a lot of reason to really code. Um, and even if there were. Uh, we have a director of ops who's who's with us, um, and basically I've, I've forced her to have to uh, learn my coding system and 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 kind of take on the brunt of that work. She'll be doing that in match for us anyway, so I can yeah, yeah. focus more on the co uh, coaching side. So, right. um, when I was at UMBC, I did the coding and coaching at the same time, and let me tell you, it's uh, yeah, it's I a lot. Even, yeah, I don't even want to guess. <laughs> I mean, even for me, doing something like trying to do uh, solo stats where, where you, all you're doing is the end of the end of rally stat. Even that for me, if I'm a head coach, it's like, whoa, I just, I don't know. I don't think I can do this. Yeah. So I, before this meeting started, I gave myself, and you can see I got to three, four in the score in this match at Norseca. Um, that's as much practice and coding that I've had <laughs> since October of 2019. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> But I'll tell you, Ryan, once you once you pick it up, and if you get rusty and you take a break from it and come back to it, it is like riding a bike, to be perfectly mm -hmm. honest. It's a really complicated bike, but it's like riding a bike. Like it just it never goes away. Assuming you already know how to touch type, which I'm hoping is the mm -hmm. case. Yeah. Um, that is probably the biggest hurdle to people learning how to code um over anything else is whether they can type without having to look down at the keyboard so if you're already there you're ahead of a bunch of other people that i've um i've had to help walk through this process mm -hmm. okay. so um in any case you, your match setup you already know how to do so whether you're mm -hmm. you're live in the gym whether it's practice a match or you're coding off the video it's all the same you set up your match you enter the rosters you put your lineups in um from there, now you got to figure out, okay, what the heck do I type? <laughs> okay. Um, so starting things off, um, most important thing to know is, um, I think in chapter three, it talked about the different um, action codes, yes. right? So yeah. A for attack, R for receive, E for set, B for block, D for dig, S for serve, et cetera. Um, what you need to know is when you hit that key or something that's associated to that action code, um, that is when the timestamp goes in to data volley. Mm -hmm. So if I'm coding it off a of video or if I'm coding it live and you sync it later, I really want to be um, hopefully as accurate as possible with the timing that I hit that keystroke because um, that's how it syncs best to the video. And then you have less kind of scrolling back and forth trying to searching for different codes. Um, okay. That being said, can you guess what the most important one to get correct is? Mm. If you read the book, you should. I can't. I can't remember. <laughs> this is an <laughs> Sir, service, sir, sir. Yeah, you got to start that rally at the right time, right? So you just make sure you have the serve code um, hit when you know the player contacts the ball. Um, so. In this, in this rally, for instance, 
Um, when you look at in the bottom right here, this is just kind of how I set up my screen. You can set it up any way you want. Um, but you can see that um, Canada's setter number 13, um, Bree King is serving. So I want to hit the S key when she contacts the ball. Okay. Um, the way we differentiate between the away team and the home team um, is unique to data volley in the idea that a lowercase a before a player number will designate that as an away team. Mm -hmm. So we need to make sure that we understand the difference between the uh, capital A, which is an attack code, and the lowercase a, um, which just designates that this code was for an away player. Right. So if it's an away girl, uh, away player, male or female, um, who is going to be serving the ball, I would say lowercase a, and in this case, she's number 13, I type 13. And then when she contacts the ball, I would hit S. Okay. Um, how do we designate it as a home player? Technically speaking, it's an asterisk. But the lovely part about data volley is that the asterisk is your default. So if you don't type anything for home or away and you just type 13, that would mean home 13. Mm -hmm. So you're saving yourself um, keystrokes here. Okay, so basically to get started when you're learning, I would recommend you just practice serve so you can get the, the timing of typing the numbers and home and away um, and hitting the S key for the serve. Um, and then as soon as possible, try and tie that into a receive. Okay. So if I were to do this rally, for instance, and I'll just back it up so I have some time to talk about it. Um, 13 is going to start. I can actually hit her number before she contacts it because like I said, when you hit the S key is when the timestamp starts. So as she serves, I'm going to hit S and I'm going to associate it to Michelle Barshackley 14 passing the ball. Notice here that I did not hit R for receive. The only reason that works is because I'm doing what we call compound coding. And this is referenced to in the book, I think in chapter four. Yeah. Um, this period allows me to have data folly, data volley default associate two players and what their contacts were. So after a serve, for the most part, because we're post 1980 something, um, the only thing that happens after a serve, if it's playable, is a receive. So Data volley, because I put this period in here connecting these two um, actions, by default, if I just hit enter here, you'll see in my codes list, it by default enter to receive code for me. So when you're practicing right now and learning how to code, I would recommend you basically never hit the R key ever. There's almost no reason to do it unless maybe you're in practice and um, mm -hmm. you just want to code the receptions. You don't care about the serves because it's like a coach snapping a ball in. Right. Mm -hmm. right. If you're coding matches, if you're coding six on six, if you're coding like a scored competitive six on uh, competitive servers versus passage drill, you're going to do serve and pass probably. So there's no reason really to ever hit the R key. So again, that was, I hit away 13, serve, when she contacted the ball, period, to make it a compound code. So data volley defaults the opposite team, which would be home, 14, to receive the ball. And I graded it as perfect, which would be a pound. Hashtag for the youngins out there. Right. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, that was actually one of the things when I was going through the book, Jeff, you, you, obviously you start off with the codes and then you later get into the compound codes. And I'm like, why would I want to learn the full code if I can just go straight to the compound code? Seems so like that would reason, save you time. The reason I laid it out so that it, it discusses, for instance, just for this serve and pass, 
you can see that there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight total keystrokes here. If I were to do this with true default coding, it would be A13S space 14 um, star 14 R pound, which is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 keystrokes. So by compound coding, I actually saved myself two keystrokes, mm -hmm. which is important when we want to start doing type of serve, where it came from, where it went. Um, did the passer pass it her right, left, midline, um, all that fun stuff, right? You want to save as many keystrokes as possible. Well, and so, to, you, to your earlier point about, say, practice, where, say, the coach is chipping in the ball, that might be a time where you just start with a receive and, and go from there. Absolutely, for sure. Like, if you're going to practice coding in practice, and you can do it. Either way, uh, if you're just trying to get that rhythm in there, you can do this. If you're not counting those stats for anything, it doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. um, but there's almost no reason to hit the R key if you're actually coding um, a match or a competitive drill in practice or, or anything like that because um, you're going to code the serve before it. Right. Um, so if you compound code, data volley will, by default, um, give you that reception for you so you don't have to hit it. Does that all make sense, Ryan? Yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, now, Jeff, let me ask you something. Under the new NCAA scoring system, there's no export data volley, is there? The the, the actual the NCAA the, score, the new scoring the, system. The software, uh, the software, the software. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what you're talking about, so I'm gonna guess. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm saying I'm I'm saying for the live stats. Because we have to oh. use the, the NCAA live stat program now. Yeah, they don't use um, they don't use data volley for any of that stuff. Okay. Um, so uh, and and quite frankly, it's not like data volley is an is an NCAA sponsor. Um, right. So like they're not contracted with the NCAA. So I would see no reason why the NCAA would put in the extra effort to. Effort. Okay. Like create. Well, yeah, and they're not going to they're not going to grab all the end rally stuff. They're only grabbing the stuff that that shows up on the box score. So yeah, in right. order to get them to match up, you literally have to go back into the match and fill in all those fill them areas. In. Yeah, which right. man, that that sounds like a pain in the yeah. So the live yeah. stats, for instance, they'll give you who served it. They'll give you who had the assist, mm -hmm. and they'll give you who terminated the rally. Okay. Um, which might be okay if you're just trying to get, you know, just rotation tape going to rally right. to rally. But if you're trying to get anything out of it, there's just so much data that's missing. Mm -hmm. Missing. Okay. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I mean, Ryan, that's basically where I recommend you start practicing is mm -hmm. just, I need to practice the home and away key, which is mostly just the away key. Obviously, I'm not going to hit shift A to hit the lowercase a. If you did the keyboard remapping, the same mm -hmm. that I did um, as part of the setup process, I think in chapter two, um, mm -hmm. it should be like the semicolon on your keyboard. Yeah. So it tried to put the like your most commonly used keys just kind of on the home row. So basically, again, I'm just going to practice all the serves and receptions as much as I possibly can early on until I'm used to it. So a 13 serve dot 14 pound. And that's it. This is what you're grinding out <laughs> up until you feel like you're confident in your um, timing and in your accuracy of getting the player numbers and grading the pass. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, again, you don't have to grade the serve because the compound code will default um, grade it for you based on what you graded the reception. Okay. Right. That's the beauty of the compound code. Right. <clears throat> Once you get too. comfortable on the serve and receive part, to me, um, the next most important thing is getting first attack. Um, mm -hmm. Because again, scouting wise, like I want to look at rotation tapes and I want to know what they're running in system on first ball, right? So um, I'm just going to go from here on that reception. After the reception, serve and reception, I'm going to go back and get first attack. 
So for me, this would then turn into away team 13. I can pre-enter that. It doesn't matter until I hit the S key. So I go serve.14 received perfect and then space 14 PG kill. Notice that there's a space instead of a period here, right. right? Because I can't do a compound code between two attacks that don't by default happen back to back, right? So after reception is not always immediately succeeding in an attack. Right, because you get the set in between. Because you got the set in between or maybe yeah. it's a yeah. overpassed like pass and then there's a free ball pass or a block on the other side of the net or something like that. Mm -hmm. Right. So by default, you're supposed to, again, just base level coding and data volley. You put a space in between every code, mm -hmm. but for certain things we can do a compound coding, which gives us the ability to save some keystrokes and not to hit the space bar so often. So this is how this is about as long as each of your rallies should look. Um, you know, a, as you first get started providing some sort of scout film and being able to do some level of analysis. Mm -hmm. So from just this observe, pass, and attack, um, I can know who the strong and weak servers are. So do I want to change my serving targets? Do I want to maybe change what um, rotation we're starting in, right? As far as who our strong and weak servers are. Um, and then obviously first attack, you can figure out, um, you know, which team is more efficient on first ball. What, who do they like to set on first ball? Who do you like to set on first ball? Who's most efficient for you guys on first ball, all that kind of stuff, which is, I mean, a huge, huge, huge percentage of what people focus on trying to figure out when they're just scouting in general, right? right? Is first ball distribution stuff and, it, and theoretically i don't know how many people actually do this but you could put a set quality assignment before the attack as, a, as its own compound code could you not so the set is, the set will never be compound coded to anything okay so it has to be separate so so for instance I, if i were to code this this rally again for you and we'll just keep looking at the same rally because why the heck not um you'll see that I'll do away 13, Jordan Poulter on our side, serve compound to 14, pass perfect two, set 14 PG kill. So the set code will always be separated with a space in between. Right. The only other things that you will compound code down the road besides serve and receive will be an attack with something else. So mm -hmm. it'll be an attack with a block contact, which is the data volley default, or it'll be an attack with a dig. And the way that would work, and I can actually do this here as well. So say that this, um, you know what, yeah, let's just start the rally over again. And let me just code this as I would code on my own. We can just talk about the different codes that are entered there um, after the fact. So what does this all mean is the question. That was quite a bit more complicated than what, what we were doing before, right? Yeah, I see some extra stuff in that first bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to translate this whole block here, that is our compound code for serve and receive. It's still just serve and receive. I just added some more detail to it. So it's a weight team 13, serve the jump float from zone one to zone five, sub zone B, where home team 14 perfect passed it. At which point, after that, home team number two set the ball. And I can even do this. It was a perfect set. Set the ball where the play set was a go three wave. Or go three red. Sorry, wave is what we use at Grand Canyon. Um, 
to number 14, home, who hit a go to area one subzone C and got a kill, at which point away team number 16 single blocked and didn't affect the play. So this is the kind of data that you could potentially get fairly right. quickly. Fairly quickly. <laughs> with a, with a, a bit of training and practice. Well, practice. I mean, fairly quickly as far as as the rally is going on and, and, yeah. and once you get to the point where you can code out this stuff, um, you can pull this information pretty quickly, just kind of yeah. live as you're going along. To get to this point, um, again, it, it'll, like any other skill, just, just takes a bunch of um, reps, practice mm -hmm. reps, that kind of stuff. Um, so it just, it takes some time. And that's why I think in the book, I, I kind of detailed out at least logically in my head, what made sense as far as your priorities of what you want to practice and kind of get in, which first yeah. step is always serve and receive. And then goes to serve, receive first attack. And then for me, it's serve, receive all attacks. And then from there, all attacks plus kind of rally ending contact. So whether it was like a block stuff, block error, you know, dig error, you know, that kind of stuff. Right. Um, yeah. And then you start to layer in more information as you go along, depending on what your head coach, John, prioritizes for information that you want to have on hands for your analysis, for your team and, and, and scouting as well. Well, every coach wants everything, right? Yeah, but you got to put everything, priorities everything in there depending you... on what Brian's able to provide to <laughs> every, right? so, Everything you could possibly give me, that's what we want. Listen, we're talking about a part timer here. Don't kill him. <laughs> well, okay. Like, all right. So, Are you taking this all in, Ryan? Yeah. Yeah. So, from what we've discussed so far, Ryan, what questions do we have? I think it's just. I think it for me, I just have to do it on my own and learn it on my own, and really strive to, you know understand the code um i think the grading part of it as well i'm gonna have to take the time and you know obviously yeah. tweak my grades a little bit um because there's some some there's some grades that ones and twos are a little off sometimes <laughs> um out of a three well, the, yeah the, the interesting thing about data ball is you're basically going off a four point scale yeah rather than a three point scale yeah, so that's something I have to like teach myself is going off off a four and then a normal three. So um, I'll ask this follow up question then, and this is specifically to you, John. Is looking forward, yeah, let me you, on my Hold on. do you want to use a three point or four point scale? It's a good question, um, and it's it's a little bit of the the irony I see in in being able to run an efficient, quick offense especially in the middle, is that at the national team level, you can run the quick offense off of good, off of a plus. Most, and a lot of the times, maybe not all the time, but a lot of the times. Mm -hmm. Whereas as you drop down, you have to be more precise to be able to do it. So you have to be closer to, as my Europeans friends would say, doubly plus. <laughs> uh, well, maybe he's not, well, I mean, that's it, an Argentine who coaches in, in Europe. So I don't know which side that comes from. Uh, so yeah, we'll have to, we'll have to look at that and see, do we need to tweak? I mean, can we stay with the three and tweak it a little bit so that it makes sense for us or should we just go to the four and, and have it done? There's, there's really two solutions there, um, which is really just an end result solution for you, John. And it may not change what Ryan has to do. Um, he can code everything as a four point scale. Uh, but just the formulas he builds will just equate the, the four point and three point as the same weight, right? right? So all of a sudden it just, they all become three points, right? Right. Um, so that's, that's an option for sure. Um, when I was at USC, and again, I, I worked with both the women's team and the men's team um, on the women's side, Mick was a, uh, he was a three point scale user. Um, so I the first season I got there, I never hit the pound key for um, for grading receptions. I just let everything be default, default so I could just save on um, keystrokes. 
Uh Um, And then on the men's side, uh, Jeff Nygaard won it on the four point scale. Um, And the perfect example of the reason why um, was we were scouting Pepperdine at one point before playing them. And across their last six or seven matches before we were set to play them that weekend, um, they would run the middle 88% of the time on a four point pass and would drop to 50% on a three point pass. That's huge. Right. So wow. there's some level of differentiation there. And like you said, now you talk about division three men's or women's volleyball, um, you know, that, that range at which your setter can execute that set and that range at which your middles can, can actually create a good enough window for your setter to set into may be quite a bit tighter. Um, so you'll kind of debate that as, as you go along and how much detail and differentiation you kind of want to have there. Um, my recommendation for Ryan is code the four point because you might as well learn it. Mm -hmm. And then if you opt not to use that in your analysis numbers wise, in your worksheets and formulas and all that kind of stuff, um, it's easy enough to work around, you know, but if you don't have that data entered, then you'll never have that detail there if you want to go back later maybe and, and look at it from a four-point scale perspective. Um, so I would just recommend just, just learning how to do it anyways. And if you end up moving on somewhere else um, and going to code for somebody that isn't John uh, who wants a four-point scale, you already know how to do yeah. it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So just but kind of future-proofing it's, yourself. It's worth noting that based on the keyboard setup that you guys recommended, makes the 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 good the plus the default correct correct so actually you only really need to learn three keystrokes to to get the whole scale um well ish kind ish. of i mean so so um there is a negative yeah right so so you'd have um there's technically five grades that that you would use six starting yeah starting really? zero so there'd yeah, be five five's. that you have to type Right, because the plus or the three point uh, would be your default. Um, so you've got your pound for perfect. You've got your exclamation point, which is kind of your medium pass, like your two point pass. You've got the minus, um, which is your um, like one point pass. Right. Uh, you've got the slash, um, which would designate like an overpass, which in your formula would be like a 0.5 reception. And then the equal sign, which would be the error or the zero. Mm-hmm. So there's actually five grades that you would have to get your fingers used to typing, um, knowing that you already have um, one default there in the plus. Right, and then theoretically, you could decide to switch that up to whatever happens most. Like at our level, we might see a lot of twos. Mm-hmm. So we'd say, okay, we want to default to, to the, the exclamation point. Yeah, and that's in your settings. You can change um, your scouting options to change what you want your defaults to be um, for for each of these um, each of these codes. So this option here, the drop down, is for your default code if you just enter a number and not an attack uh, and, and not a action code. Right. So if I were to hit just thirteen and hit enter. For me, it would default to a free ball contact. Okay. Okay. The logic behind that for me is that it doesn't screw up my numbers potentially down the road uh, as far as, you know, any sort of efficiencies, like attacks and things like that. Like, I I don't want to be like, okay, this was supposed to be um, a reception, but now it's defaulted to being an attack and now everything's screwed up. If I do a free ball, it's kind of no harm, no foul. I can find it. I can fix it. There aren't a ton of free balls, um, true free balls that are in, in a match, um, ideally. Um, when I was coaching D3, <laughs> there were a ton. Um, but, you know, it is what it is. So you can change that to whatever you want it to be. Same thing here on the right. These options for each of the different attack, uh, sorry, action codes. You see that I have plus all the way down the board. Mm-hmm. The plus side is my default um, for everything. Yeah. And you could, like you said, change your default to be a exclamation point, or it can be a pound sign, or it can be a minus or whatever you want. Um, 
but this is just kind of what I, I, I use because there are a ton of pluses in a match in general, at least for the levels at which uh, I had gotten used to coding. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, that's just, that's, that's kind of where, where I've sat. I do know a lot of people at the division one level who use the um, pound sign as their default. Um, but to me, a pound sign very often, especially if you're talking about rally ending, um, you know, those, those are quote unquote special to me. So I like hitting a key for those. So um, that's just kind of where it, it sits for me. Right. Yeah. And, and the one thing I wanted to note earlier is <clears throat> we don't all have, you know, great video that we're working from. Um, so the <laughs> fact that the fact that data volley has the screen there, like you've got on your, your setup where it shows who's where you've got a quick reference without having to try to, you know, look in the video and figure out, all right, who is that setting on the other side? You know, what rotation are they in? Um, yeah. Um, I, when I was at UMBC and this is pre pre volumetrics or at least pre widespread volumetrics, let's put it that way. Um, in the America East, we were not using volumetrics as the video share. We were using some other third party. Um, and so basically teams would share video and then, very few people use data volley in that conference at the time. Right. Um, so they would just, you share the video with everybody and you share maybe score sheets. Not everybody would share like the lineup, like the score sheets, right? So sometimes you have to figure out what the lineups are on your own and the video is not great. Right. Like how the heck do you do that? Um, the way I did that is what Ryan was talking about is the the play-by-play. -play. So the, I would go uh, to the, the live report. score or whatever play-by-play yeah. -play stats from their their, their team's, you know, schedule, basically, that the, mm -hmm. their SIDs would upload. And I would actually go there and i go, okay, who was their first server? And I would write that down. Who was their second server? Write it down, et cetera, et cetera, and kind of go through that way to try and figure it out. Um, honestly, you, you may have to end up doing that also because there's no guarantees you're going to get good quality video. Um, yeah. And you're, there's no guarantees people are going to share their their score sheets in a timely manner you know yeah even though it's supposedly part of the conference rules <laughs> we've all been there yeah but hey i mean everybody's hit some of those issues there's oh yeah. there's a two-day delay and all of a sudden you play the next day and you have time to scout so um you find different workarounds that was a workaround that i used just because I, I had to find a way to do it because there's no way for me to know who the heck they were when i'm getting this grainy almost black and white like feeling like six frames per per second, like, the, yeah. you know, Walmart security camera, like kind of <laughs> kind of video footage, right? So um, you, you got to do what you got to do. Uh, but the great part about um, when you open a match and you're doing this and you actually put the video and open it in Data Volley, as opposed to say having Data Volley here and opening up the video in like VLC or something, is it will automatically sync your keystrokes to the video for where you are in the actual video. Okay. Versus if you're coding live in the gym or if you're coding on a separate window on video, it will timestamp to real time to where you are. So for instance, say Ryan, you were coding and you got through, you know, first 15 points of the set and somebody goes and rings your doorbell and you gotta go answer it and sign for a package or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And then you come back to code and you just keep going about your business because you hit pause in the video, you'll go back and try and sync it. And now there's like a three minute gap, right? Where things are just off by three minutes because data volley was just going by, you know, real time. Mm -hmm. right. So just remember to open your video in data volley so you can pause okay. it and take a break and take a nap and, you know, curse John <laughs> for making you do all this and then come back to it later and the sync is still accurate, right? So mm. and then you can do your rewinds and fast forwards and that kind of stuff without screwing up your sync. Right. Yeah, the biggest the biggest thing is the men's we're on volumetrics for the men's. So all of our matches have to be uploaded, but for the women's it's conference only. So getting non conference play or anything on from anybody, it's pulling teeth. Mm -hmm. and um, they're only uploading the huddle, so the basic version of huddle. So, I mean, there's nothing really <laughs> worth changing a rule for, apparently, but maybe it'll change down the road. Yeah, that's that, that was our motivation for doing this, is 
we're paying what for, we say fifteen hundred for the the basic 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 package of we're paying four fifty four fifty for the basic package of volumetrics. That's right for now, and then, and then zero for just for the, upload video only on Huddle. No nothing, no stats, no nothing on that. Yeah. So at least on volumetrics we get stats. We don't get any tagging. We don't get any breakdown. We can't even fast forward, rewind, or anything like that or use the, the slider bar at all in volumetrics when watching a the video there. So you can actually download it. Um, but it would cost us like 3,000 just to, to upgrade. Well, that's just for volumetrics, right? It would be that's about, right. about yeah. the same again if we wanted to, to upgrade for the or women. maybe we set, yeah, the women. So compared to, I mean, this is, we've got DV light. That's only 300 a year. I mean, even if we went up to the full version, that's only 800 compared to what it would cost us to move up. Yeah, the thing with DB Lite though, um, again, I've never used it from what I understand, you can't do and create any custom worksheets. So you're you're basically stuck using any of the default kind of um, data volume analysis, which isn't the end of the world because I can do, for instance, just a analysis by skill and do a, you know, just a full dump of, our home team here and just export that, that to Excel and play with it in Excel. Right. Right. Um, but it is nice having a bunch of macros like formula macros and all that kind of stuff in data volley itself mm -hmm. and then different charting and, and all that kind of stuff. That's just in the program um, when you have the, the full version. Um, right. uh, actually, while you're, cause you, this is something you brought up in chapter two. Uh, in terms of selecting between cones and what's yeah. the other option? Cones uh, and, and uh, lines or zones. Lines. Yeah. Um, can you just show what the what the difference of the analysis is between those? Sure. Let me open up a match that actually has the facts in it. <laughs> <laughs> Because one of the things you pointed out is, you, is it like, aside from the being able to look at it more zonally, there's also better heat mapping. Because I think one of the things that you guys mentioned is a benefit for that. Yeah, so um, I'll show it to you this way. Uh, let's go. Just attack after reception and zooting because she's gnarly. No, she didn't play in this match. <laughs> Who played in this match? Okay, so we'll look at their opposite then. So Joe is a big proponent. Oh, they didn't set her at all on first ball. So what happens when you serve her. Um, Joe's a big proponent of the cones. Um, reason being that eventually, if you're doing like a multi-match analysis, um, there just gets to be a lot of lines, right? Um, for a single match, is not bad. And I, I use the lines and the zones instead of the cones in general um, for, I guess, two and a half reasons, right? Reason being number one is in match. I'm not really caring as much about um, the issue of overlapping lines because in a single match, generally speaking, you get a ton, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like this is one whole four set match for their starting opposite who played all four sets. So it's not like I, I'm dealing with the worst cluster of lines overlapping each other in the world. Right. Um, two is that if I want to convert this to cones, I can. But you can't go from cones, coding cones, and then convert it back to subzones. Where it's, so for instance, you see on these courts, there's obviously zones one, two, three, four, five, six, but also seven, eight, nine for that middle third. Right. And then within each of these squares is an A, B, C, and D. So technically, there's 36 subzones um, 
on the court. Um, so you remember when I was coding and I had like a 5B in there, that would be zone five here, kind of in this zone right here, right? So you don't get that level of detail with a cone. So if I code cones, I can't convert it to zones and lines and get that detail back. Gotcha. But I can start with that detail and then convert it to a cone and I'm perfectly fine. Right. It's kind of like the same logic as, you know, Ryan, we were talking about, do you want to code four point scale or three point scale? Let's code the four point scale because I could always convert it to a three point scale. But if I only code a three point scale, I can't then magically produce a four point scale. Okay. Right. Yep. Um, so that's the logic for me of why I use um, zones instead of cones. Let me show you why um, Joe likes the cones. And it'll be very evident once, I mean, I've got seven matches, which is a fairly typical college. That's how many matches you'll maybe have to non-COVID season, you know, um, scout a team. Mm -hmm. If I just do, let's go Kim Hill attacks. It's a lot of lines. And from that, you start to lose a bunch of detail in here too, right? With some of these deflections off the block and little tips down here, because there's so many lines overlapping, you start to lose a bit of perspective. So that's where the cones come in handy because the cones then, um, uh, the cones then will, will give you the percentages in directions. Right. And those little wedges of directions in general. Um, so from a total analysis, as they would call it in data volley, or like an aggregate scout, as we would call it, um, the zone, the cones give you a bunch of information there that's more easily interpreted than having all these overlapping lines. Sure. Yeah. That's, that's kind of the logic there. Um, I also like to use the subzones and, and zones just because when I do analysis outside of data volley and I do heat mapping and stuff like that, um, I can actually, I, I built some very basic heat maps um, just here with the subzones. Just because I'm typing the subzones, I can actually get um, these numbers here, at which point I export this to. Um, the, obviously, the higher number, the more attacks went toward those, towards those subzones. Um, so once I export that to Excel and just do a conditional formatting, boom, you've got a heat map there. Um, that's pretty rudimentary, but it gets the message across, right? So that's something that you can do if you're coding the subzones that you can't do if you're just coding one through nine cones. Again, advanced skills. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It's going to get to the point where you're coding your attacks. <laughs> so just, again, importance-wise of things, Ryan, for you to really focus on right now, mm. practice, 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 and then practice, practice, and maybe practice some more. Mm -hmm. um, but again, start, start slow. And as you gain comfort, stretch, right? Okay. You just, again, it's like teaching passing, right? You know, yep. we, we don't want to overcomplicate things right away. Let's, let's start small and then and then worry about everything else after that. So um, start with serve so you can get the rhythm of, you know, home or away and the number and action code. And as quickly as possible, start getting the compound code to the receive. And then let's get really comfortable there. Because, again, at a bare minimum, that's what you need just to get rotation tape. Mm -hmm. Right? And then you can just end rally after that and then just fast forward through those rallies if you want to. But at least if you're in season and if that's the only thing you're coding in season, you can still get rotation tape where you can click through rally by rally 
really easily in data volume and be able to, you can, you know, do what most people do anyways, even if they have data volume chart by hand, right? And, 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 and draw out your charts that way and, and still be seeing what they're doing on first fall and things like that. And you can do all that just from rotation tape. Yep. Then from there, once you're comfortable there, try and get as soon as possible again to serve past the first attack because then you can actually start to pull some analyses from data volley to save yourself some time on some of the hands, like handwritten charting and trending and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And then you get to the fun stuff after you get to like serve past all attacks. And then you can really start to figure out um, overall efficiencies, like for your own players in practice. That's the big part for me is in practice then, like off your practice video, because you can pull the, your season long efficiencies overall anyways, through your box scores or through volumetrics maybe or whatever it is. Right. But if you want to break it down to like rotation by rotation or off of this setter or whatever it is, first ball versus transition, you're going to need that from data volley. Um, so as soon as you can get serve past all attacks, man, your world just opens up as far as the stuff that you can figure out um, and analyze on your own team and, and uh, for other teams. Right. Now, once I get going, could I could pair it to the VM stats or am I, is that, or is the numbers like analysis completely different? Uh, their, their codes or their out? No, like just like the stats itself. So like okay. first ball attack for hitting percentages and things like that. Yes, first you can. Balls. Okay. For sure you can. Um, I will say that there will be some differences because volumetric, okay. like, like humans will make some mistakes here and there. A lot right. of what they do is machine driven as mm -hmm. far as the analysis is concerned so it's just kind of they're analyzing the video and making kind of a predictive analysis based on literally the pixels on the screen so right um so it's it's not always the volumetric stats aren't going to be a hundred percent accurate mm -hmm. um but it's a nice base for you to know hey are, are my stats in the ballpark mm -hmm. okay right especially if we're looking at to start like passing numbers mm -hmm. right am i in the ballpark or am i like uh, volumetrics, and they give you a four and three point scale for volumetrics. Mm -hmm. um, oh, on a three point scale on volumetrics, she's passing a two, three, one. But for some reason, my stat, she's passing a one, seven, nine. Okay, there's an issue here. <laughs> <laughs> right. But if she's a two, three, one, and my stat, she's a two, seven, a two, like a two, two, seven, cool. I mean, we're fine. Yeah. Okay. You know, okay. just one or two. Yeah. And, and one of the things that you, you guys talked about in the book in terms of practice is you can do it whatever you don't need to be doing six v six it could be four v four just get in there and either do it live or get some video and i mean we're be I, practice, I, so. I was that nerd after i did like a 10-day volunteer thing with joe the summer before i got to umbc um specifically because ian wanted me to data volley for them and i had never used data volley before i got to anaheim so he just boot camped me for 10 days and we get a ton of, of really high quality reps, obviously in the USA gym. But when I got home, you don't have access to that. Yeah. I saved some video files and stuff like that. So you could practice off a of video. Um, but you just found some random YouTube videos of matches at some, whatever, not the perfect scout angle on the baseline. Cause if you're coding and match on the bench, you don't get that view. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So you got to get used to looking at stuff from some sort of funky views. John, I don't know if you're a walker and a talker as a coach, but Ryan, you might have to be looking between his armpits at some point. <laughs> Definitely. <Right? laughs> so, not a sitting coach. So. so, so practice with whatever you have available. Live is always best, honestly, because it forces you to have to be quick and make decisions on the fly without going into total brain meltdown mode and just stopping because you can't pause, you can't rewind. Mm -hmm. um, I think in the book we talk about um, not using the rewind or slow motion function at all when you're practicing because yeah. you don't get that live. Mm -hmm. um, I will say that when you're first learning, yeah, don't use that at all. But if you're in the season and you're starting the rhythm and you want to verify, okay, was that a three? Or, hey, I missed the set contact there. You can always rewind. I use the rewind stuff. Um, you know, and not super frequently, but definitely right now, if I were to code right now, you'd see me use a lot of rewind because I'm just getting back up on that bicycle, right? So, mm -hmm. so, you know, but if you're in rhythm because you got back-to-back -back seasons between women's and men's and you're coding a bunch, then 
um, you know, ideally you, you, you might not have to use it a ton. So I would recommend you don't practice using that or slow motion because again, you, you, you're not going to get that benefit when you're coding in the gym, right? State dependent learning, right, John? You know, <laughs> exactly. Well, and to that point, you, you guys recommend don't use a caller either for, for very much the same reason. Yeah. <laughs> Simone, any questions? No, I was just taking a lot of notes. So hopefully when I can like get my window pants on. Yeah. No, I um I think that was when you said the call person thing, because that was the one because I have been the call person for someone trying to do it. So I thought, oh, went before I read that on there, I was like, oh, I probably figured out that type of way for me and Lang, but then I was like, oh, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the call person, that's actually it's not bad when you're first getting started. Um in fact, I remember this is before Data Volley even had a graphical user interface. They used Data Volley at Stevens when Joe and I were there as, as undergrads. Um, and we would have a call person. I never did it. I quit the men's varsity team before I ever had to do it for, they've always made the freshman do it, right? Yeah. I quit the varsity team because one, I was about a foot too short. And two, um, I, yeah, it just, I, I wasn't good enough. But I never ended up having to do it for the women's team. But I remember sitting next to them while they were doing it, calling it out. Um, you, you miss out on a lot, yeah. um, as a coder when you're doing that, uh, mm -hmm. for two reasons. One, it's slow to, to translate the audio into some sort of actual tactical mm -hmm. feedback there. Um, and then two, you're then dependent on the speed of your caller, mm -hmm. right? And eventually, and that's kind of the goal, I think in John, in your mind, the goal for Ryan, right, is he's going to get a bunch of information. Yeah. Right. right. And hopefully you're going to start getting this directional stuff and, and all that kind of stuff too. So Simone, imagine trying to call out, right. 13 serve from one to zone five yeah, past perfect. <laughs> 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 Especially when I was looking at, you know, what the different um, attack variations. So when I was calling, I was never calling out attack variations mm -hmm. back then. So I was like, I, there would be no way for to get all of those different plays down and all of that trying to right. get that over to Lang or communicate that to myself is just going to be easier to watch. You could, but <laughs> I, think, see us I going think at Ryan's it. brain would explode. <laughs> yeah, probably. Yeah, well, knowing Lang, he probably, I can't do this. <laughs> I, I remember um, I always travel with uh, earplugs, you know, for one reason or another, like loud in the gym, they put your yeah. band right behind your bench, like, you know, whatever it is. Um, and I'm sitting first chair this is where I, I sat first chair with the men's team at USC um, and, or like second chair or whatever it was. I think it was first chair. Um, and that's right next to the scores table. Yeah. And they had their, their, um, their SIDs or their interns doing the live score and the live mm -hmm. stats. So they use the collar. Yep. And one, they're getting stuff wrong. Yeah. But two, <laughs> like it's just, they're throwing out these numbers and they're delayed. And I'm already three or four contacts ahead of them mm -hmm. and it's just like messing with my head like trying so if you want to screw with somebody coding sit yeah. behind them and just start recite like calling out numbers, <laughs> right? it's just it's it's one of the most like difficult things to do is kind of keep your focus on what you're trying to do because it's a language in of itself right yeah. so yeah. it's just it, it, it gets the calling thing is to me a hindrance more than a help once you get past just serve pass attack when you want to get detail Appended right. to each of those, um, it's yeah. You got to talk I, really fast. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've I've sat next to somebody coding during a match, and yeah, I, all I said every once in a while, I mean, he would every once in a while ask, "Did so and so, you know, which player made a certain play?" Because maybe he was he was a little bit behind with his code and, and wasn't quite able to catch it, or or maybe there was an obstruction and he couldn't quite see it or something like that, but. Yeah, I didn't. I was not about to get in there and start just yammering off codes the whole time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that'll happen too. Like you'll miss something, and then yeah. you'll ask, "Oh, he who who dug that ball?" Mm -hmm. Right? Because right. sometimes, like, okay, there's mm -hmm. you're maybe you're screened out by the blockers. You couldn't see who it was. It was kind of in a seam, um, or John standing in front of you on the bench. So and you're like doing the old like <laughs> thing, kind of going back and forth, trying to figure it out. Um, but the thing is, you just keep going. You type somebody in there, but you know that 
maybe you were wrong and then you can go back and fix it anyways. Like it doesn't take a ton of time to double click and change the number, you know? Um, so that's, I think the biggest, one of the biggest things I took from Joe when he was teaching me was just keep typing. Going, yeah. Yep. You know, the moment you like freeze, mm -hmm. then everything's gone, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And then you lose the whole rest of the rally. Like I would rather lose two contacts at some midpoint in the rally and go back and find them later mm -hmm. than stop and miss the next 15 contacts because the ball went back and forth three times over the net. And I just go, I threw my hands up and he was like, I don't know what's going on right now. And I end the rally and just, just pout in the corner. Right. <laughs> Someone knows that'll be me at some point. <laughs> <laughs> Throwing a clipboard or something. Hey, I've broken many clipboards. Uh, leave me alone. Uh, yeah. Uh, Jeff, you ever used the the uh, the apps that Ben Raven put together? Um, actually, I was just emailing with Ben um, five minutes before I got on this call. All right. Um, so down in, down in Tasmania. Yeah, yeah. How how he? Yeah, it's just we're trying to get him to present um, for us at the next kind of tech academy. Okay. Um, I think John, you joined us the, the first time yeah, as an yeah. attendee. Um, he was on it too. I'm just like, man, that time changed. I don't know what time it is for him, but you know, um, but yeah, so, um, myself, um, I picked up on it two years later than he did. So Nate go, who's the, uh, the scout, the tech coordinator for the men's national team started dabbling with R, um, a couple of years ago, um, maybe three years ago now. Um, but I didn't pick up on it until kind of the off season of 2000, kind of winter of 2019. So going into the 2019 USA season, basically mm -hmm. that like sure. after 18 had ended and there was just so much more stuff we wanted to study that I just could not do in data volley. Eventually yeah. I finally broke down. I walked over to Nate's office and sat down. I was like, all right, you're teaching me. <laughs> right. So, um, yeah, he gave me like three or four hours worth of his time to kind of get me started and then was like all right go to google university and figure it out mm -hmm. from there. Right? that's kind of how he learned and that's how a lot of people learn but um so yeah we're all using that package that he put together to translate data poly files into something that we can use into like a flat file that we can use in r um and a bunch of people are using that to pull stuff and and you know look at stuff with python or tableau or, or others or other things that you can do so right. Um, yeah, yeah, for sure. We're, we're using, using that. And the great part about R is free. Yes. I yeah. actually, I made the switch. I don't know. I guess it was maybe April. It was shortly after I started doing the conversation series and for which I had been on with Mark Lebedew to do one of them. Uh, and, and, and the free was the biggest part because I needed to do some academic level research and I had been using Stata before, mm -hmm. but I lost my license you know, because I was You're no at longer university at university now, and you uh, have two rosters I, full of where, students. Where, <laughs> okay, that you can get free student Tableau licenses, one year licenses, as long as they have a student email address. There you go. Um, and just you just keep cycling through a different student every year, <laughs> and if they have a lot of my email addresses, you keep doing that. So I, I have friends who do that. They, they don't pay for Tableau because they just keep using student licenses for free. Sorry. I wouldn't put this out publicly, maybe <laughs> cut this part out of the video, but it's definitely something that you can do. Um, and then again, I, I don't know what Madai's kind of STEM programs are like, but um, if they do have any stuff that is in the data sciences, a lot oftentimes universities will have kind of an enterprise wide sort of license with Tableau as well. So you can accomplish a lot of what we're doing in R um without having to learn how to physically code a lot of that stuff um and it just it makes things a little bit easier to do yeah. some of the interactive analyses in time yeah. but i'm definitely well familiar with uh, google university <laughs> like okay how do we do this oh perfect <laughs> code google, example there you go <laughs> a lot of google a lot of stack overflow a lot of mm -hmm. you know reddit chains and yeah. Whatever. A lot of YouTube. Honestly, I've, I've done a lot of YouTube stuff too. So, yep. um, and by done, I mean I've watched other people's YouTube. Videos. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, you know, uh, there's and this is the thing. There's not a lot of that for data volume. 
right? They're, they're really right. isn't. Right. Um, which is a lot of why Joe and I kind of put the book together because we tried to make it as step-by-step step as, as, as possible. So yeah. um, Ryan, for sure, I think you're, you're ahead of the game as far as what you would read in the book right now going mm-hmm. forwards. You know how to, how to get started, what it looks like, um, what your priorities are. So really right now it's all about practice. Mm-hmm. And then as a reference, if you need to, chapter four is there, I think, that goes through that process of coding and yeah. mm-hmm. Um, kind of the logic of what the base codes are and how we kind of convert that into compound codes, which we walked through a little bit live. So um, that stuff should make hopefully a lot more sense to you reading it now versus if you had to read it just kind of fresh. Right. For sure. All right. If you guys don't have any other questions, we can uh, say thanks to Jeff. Yeah. Thank you so Um, much for doing this. Thank you.